Welcome to the AGO, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Stefan Yost. I'm the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. Today we're joined by Maria Balshaw. She's the Director of the Tate in London, London, England, not London, Ontario. So welcome to the AGO. We'd like to begin our events by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which has also been home to the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee people through time. Today's conversation is being sponsored by our own Toronto Dominion Bank. So TD's Ready Commitment is helping us during this period to make sure that we facilitate and have great conversations with, with our public. Next week, please join us with a conversation, same time, same place, with Linda Harrison. Linda is the extraordinary director of the Newark Museum in New Jersey, which is really one of the most interesting and dynamic cultural centers currently in the United States. This morning, the AGO announced that all frontline workers can sign up for a free annual pass for the next month. So they can sign up. And um, I was hoping for a couple hundred people to sign up, but um, as of an hour ago, over 1,600 people have joined today. About 80% of those people are healthcare workers, but it's really open to, to anybody who's frontline. So if you know a cashier who was kind to you during the at the grocery store, tell them to go to AGO CA, um, sign up, and they can come to all exhibitions and the entire museum free for a year. So um, thank you for joining us, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. And that's a great thing to be doing. Um, at Tate Britain, we're um, just across the road from St. Thomas Hospital, which has been one of the major um, centers for COVID care okay. over the last few months. And um, we've been turning the building blue to celebrate them, but we're also oh. inviting them back in um, uh, when we open um, in just 10 days. So it's yeah. just, it feels really important that we're all doing um, things to support all of those people who've been keeping things going during this difficult yeah. period. Yeah, and, and you re we really saw several months ago, who is frontline? Who do we need, you know, sanitation and, and yeah. uh, cashiers and hospitals as well. Um, one thing I've been asking people um, is just to talk a little bit about a work of art um, that you've been drawing inspiration from that's in the Tate's collection? What, what's something that really resonates during this period? Yeah. Well, I think I have to say Cara Walker's Fons Americanus, huh. which is currently in the Turbine Hall at Tate Modern. And it's not in the collection, it's a commission. You know, it was made for the, the space of the Turbine Hall. And um, it, it came to us last autumn and felt at that point an incredibly important and prescient piece of work. Um, it's a large sculpture, which is uh, um, a fountain. So it, um, it takes its inspiration from the Victoria Memorial that's in front of Buckingham Palace and remakes that from the perspective of the, um, the Atlantic Passage. Um, and so it speaks of the history of slavery and the movement of peoples across the globe. Um, and it speaks of the, um, the imperial um, uh, history of, of statuary. And, you know, our, our cities are full of these monuments. And of course, at the moment in the UK, um, as part of the wider debates and protests around Black Lives Matter, we saw the toppling of the statue of William Colston. Um, uh, in Bristol, one of the, the most notorious of um, uh, people involved with, the, um, with slavery and um, plantations um, from Britain's past. And, and that debate runs on. Mark Quinn made um, uh, the figure of um, uh, one of the protesters and put it on the plinth yep. last, um, yesterday, and this morning it was removed. And <laughs> So this is a live and important debate for us in the UK. And it's about looking at um, those very uncomfortable histories. Yeah. Cara's work was already doing that in yeah. Turbine Hall, but it was also, it's also a space of gathering. Um, like many of those huge um, monuments and sculptures are. So it's circular for the duration that we've had it, people have sat around it and used it yeah. as a meeting place. Huh. And, you know, as is so characteristic with her work, she gives us some humor and some real challenge. So the, the kind of the playbill notice that goes with the sculpture asks us to address her reworking of the spectacle of empire, slavery, the middle passage. It's, and, you know, Britain is right smack in the middle of, of these conversations with 
with colonialism. How do you how do you negotiate that? It's clearly with with um, Kara Walker's work, you've kind of addressing it front on in some ways. Um, what are some other things that you're doing to kind of um, reconcile the history? Well, I think staff across the organization are, are all asking these questions at the moment. And it's been part of the, um, the program over the last three years that we, um, at least at Tate, um, that we think about the, the 500 years of British art that we hold and then our international collections and, and um, use those artworks and, um, and the histories that they, um, they tell or hold um, to address our current moment and our relationship with that history. Yeah. So we are doing a research project around um, the notion of decolonizing the, the history of British art, which will involve things like um, looking at um, one, things that one academic described as um, uh, the embarrassing and uncomfortable objects that you find when you look back. Yeah. So, painting from the 18th century or 19th century statuary and we've we've got to open up discussion and dialogue um, about these matters i don't think most people realize your academic background and your academic specialty can you chat about that a little bit because it links to this conversation well it it does very much um, in that my I would, my academic training was in um cultural studies and um and american studies so my PhD was about the Harlem Renaissance and the period before and after it um, and started with literature. So I was a literary scholar long before I started to write and work on visual art. But for me, the, um, the, the kind of theoretical frame, the important text was Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic okay. and the debates that um, uh, came out of that book which was, he, he writes about music and art and architecture and literature. And, and it was understanding the interrelationships between those forms yeah. and, and then how they shape and relate to um, the history of um, colonization and the history of empire. Um, that he could move so fluently from a record shop in Camden to writing about Toni Morrison to thinking about Turner's painting of the slave ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that for me gave me a framework for thinking about visual culture more broadly. Yeah. And, um, and the, the work that came out of Birmingham's cultural studies department under Stuart Hall's leadership, all of that was a, has been exploring notions of identity and belonging and the histories of nationalisms and, and race for 30 years. And, our moment now in museums, it's getting to grips with that in a way that is, is probably um, long overdue. Well, I think it's certainly long, yeah, long yes. overdue. Yeah, yeah. There was um, that gradual change. And I think in many ways, um, I think I thought we were moving the AGO relatively rapidly. Um, mm. And then you look and you think, oh, you know, if our goal is to reflect the communities who live here, which is one of our goals, our major goal. Yeah. Um, ooh, we're we're really actually quite slow, um, and and yeah. that that's um, kind of got to shift gears. Yeah, I think it's an important thing to say because I I too feel that Tate. I mean, Tate has been working on this for two decades at least in terms of shifting and challenging the canons, and um, you know started um, most um, notably with Francis's work around. Jet Francis Morris at Tate yep. Modern, her work around gender, um, and and ex but also expanding the canon in terms of race and ethnicity. But like you, we want to reflect the city that we're in, the the and the UK that we operate within, and we haven't made nearly enough change, um, and not fast enough. And yeah. so, I, I'm we're trying to work with a sense of welcoming this moment and yeah. and saying. Anything that we can do to accelerate the changes we want to see, we should be as, doing. As, as Glenn Lowry said um, on a call, you know, we have the opportunity to lean in rather than lean out, right? You know, and so that's, I thought it was a simple way to say it, but I think it, it I think is um, important. Um, tell me about 
I know you came through literature, right? Kind of as a, when was your first kind of museum experience? What, what, what do you, when you look back, what are those formative, were you a kid, were you a student? Those kind of aha moments. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I was quite, um, I was nearly an adult. Um, and I was reflecting on this just the other day um, that, um, I mean, I came from a, a, a working class Irish Catholic family. Uh, we were definitely encouraged to read. That's why I got to literature. Yeah. the fastest um, um, but I may I had to make my way to museums on my own and um, just before we came on this conversation you asked me to prop my laptop up a bit and I have a Derek Jarman um, catalog yes. underneath that. he was really really important on my journey because his work his films were shown on the television on channel 4 um, in the 1980s and along with David Bowie's music I think um, Jarman gave me a sense of um, there being another place that you could get to. Yeah. yeah. So my kind of teenage desire to escape got me onto the train and down to London and actually to Tate, which is now Tate Britain, but then was only the Tate. Yeah, right. And um, it, it took a while to get there because I went first to the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and uh, in those days, it's not like this now, in those days it was lots of life, if, lots of portraits of Shakespeare. And I wasn't looking for that. <laughs> so a bit more navigation of the underground system. And I got to take Britain and, yeah. um, and I saw Bridget Riley's work. Um, huh. And that, that, for, that was the first thing that stopped me in my tracks. I'm always amazed at how when you talk to museum directors, how there, there's this moment where you fall in love with an artist or a time period, late teenager, early 20s and how that sticks with you right that 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 kind of often stays with you those formative kind of impressions and so completely um, i sometimes completely. think about our responsibility as young people you know i think both the tate and the age have an extraordinarily young audience who we show and how you know those aha moments um i thought about that when we um we did micheline thomas show and i, I just mm -hmm. thought this is going to be important for people in 20 years when they look back at this and say, oh yeah, that was a moment I felt welcome, right? So it's... Yeah, well, that's why I think Cara's work is so important because um, it, it's not an easy piece of work, but it yeah. does offer um, a, a place for reflection and, um, and, it, and it does offer a welcome. And yeah. I think this notion of welcome is so important that yeah. you come in and you find something that might ask you a question, but also makes you feel you're allowed to explore that question. Yeah. I, I think the Tate actually does in the architecture of the building and how it's curated really, really does that well. I, I still remember the Olafar Eliasson and mm -hmm. I was there with a very good friend of mine, Moira Roth, who is a, a feminist art historian, um, kind mm -hmm. of generation, she's you know, 70, 80, 80 something now and we went mm -hmm. together and just laying on the floor with a, a, a woman in her mid-70s um, it was yeah. it was great it was magical kind of as this kind of we're leading through a period of huge huge change um, and uh, uh, what values are you leaning on right now mm -hmm. um, I think compassion and um, I've never felt the importance more of um, care for colleagues, yeah. for the artists that we're working with, for the public, um, and, for, and for, it, for myself. We are having to look after ourselves, I think, in a, a new and different way. Um, and I also think a sense of, um, it's not quite a funny, but resilience at the moment. Um, that knowing that it's okay to uh, not be able to quite do something or um, pick yourself up after um, a challenging day or moment because the world at the moment is throwing so much at us. Yeah. I, there was, I, I'm 51 and there was a toy when I was about four years old or something. It was called a Weeble Wobble. And the ah. tech line was Weeble Wobble, we don't fall down. You know, you hit it and it pops right back up. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, I, I'm relating to the toy. <laughs> totally. I remember the Weebles as well. It's a very, very good, um, uh, yeah, very good metaphor for the times we're in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but unbelievably interesting, I've got to say, even though it has been very tricky, kind of humbling, bluntly. Um, it's not dull. It's not dull, kind of as a... Um, so the Tate no. was your 
kind of first primary museum experience was seeing this work by Bridget Riley. When did you realize that you might become the head of the tape? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's an extraordinary story that you're, you're, you're working at the museum where you, you, you had your first aha moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, it was so much later, uh, Stefan, that, um, I mean, at that point, I wasn't even sure that I was allowed to cross the threshold, really. Yeah. I went to university in Liverpool and, I mean, I was fortunate. My second and most important experience was Tate Liverpool because it had opened the year that I started as a student. Oh, yeah. And so that was the first museum that I became really comfortable in, you know, yeah. such that I had one particularly memorable experience lying on the floor, um, literally lying on the floor, looking at a Richard Long um, oh, yeah. huge um, um, circle of stone um, uh, that was in the gallery and lying on the floor because I had a really terrible hangover. <laughs> and, and the, the very you kind, felt comfortable there yeah I felt definitely comfortable and the kind gallery attendants didn't ask me to get up or or make any comment about the fact that I lay there with my friend for about an hour yeah. and of course it's actually possibly the best way to see a Richard Long work like that because I, I once I'd gotten over feeling a bit sick I really started to look at it yeah yeah. And gave myself the time to do that. But no, I could, I mean, I was, I trained, I did a PhD. So I was going to be an academic for my, right. um, for the rest of my career. That's what you do. I've still got friends who are academics who still think it's insane that I left you. <laughs> <laughs> this idea of a... <laughs> so it. So but, you, um, so you spent time in Manchester. Tell, tell us about Manchester. Cause it, my sense is it's very different than London, right? Well, um, it's a um, it's a different kind of industry. The, the, you know, in UK, the North is very different from the South. Um, I'm a deserter of the North now, and some of my Northern friends have still not forgiven me. Uh. Um, uh, but Manchester is a, a very interesting Northern city. I mean, seat of the Industrial Revolution. So it was one of the most successful cities in the world. It's responsible for many of the, um, much of the damage we've done in terms of um, the climate. If you think about where the notion that we should just generate more and more and more power came from. Um, and, and then in the seventies and eighties, of course, it was one of the most hit um, of the cities in terms of uh, post-industrial decline and, um, and you know, the near collapse of those Northern industrial cities. Yep. But it's got a very um, um, resilient attitude and um, it, it has built itself back up um, and is definitely the second city in the UK through a commitment to culture. Huh. So it, Michael I, Bloomberg always has that statement, capital follows culture, not the other way around. Right? Exactly, which, which exactly. Is, uh, and very prescient city leaders realised that's what was needed and um, funded and expanded the cultural infrastructure. They hosted the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. That had a huge cultural program attached to it. And I went there um, as that sort of cultural transformation was gaining momentum. Um, I knew the city quite well because I'd been in Liverpool as a student and we used to go there when it was the, it was known only for its nightclub, the Hacienda. Huh. Um, and um, it was, I was at the Whitworth, which was the university art gallery. And then I went to run the city art gallery as well. They are fantastic, they're amazing 19th and 20th century collections. You know, they're some of the great collections in the UK are held within the regional museums. It and was, I, I was in Liverpool the other year mm -hmm. for the biennial and it, um, you know, the, the museum there is this, has incredible 19th century art and you realize the wealth that was was in that city at a very particular time. Yeah, and Liverpool and Manchester were always um, in competition with one another. And mm -hmm. yeah, the collections in Manchester, are, you know, when Tate did its pre-Raphaelite show, the Dante Gabriel Rossetti uh, Astarte Syriaca that was the front cover of the catalog was from Manchester Art Gallery. Ah, uh, yeah, yes. Because yes, the I... Northern galleries have some of the best of the works. One thing we've talked about, um kind of casually was a kind of about museums and the environment kind of you've, you've spoken up kind of consistently about kind of um, thinking about culture and the environment. Can you tell me or tell us a little bit more about that, but also to think how have the current conversation informed your thinking about kind of the environmental side of things? 
Well, take de declared a climate emergency um, because we have all been thinking and working on the, the challenges around reducing our impact long term on the environment. And also because um, the collective of artists that we represent in the UK and um, uh, within the British and international collections were calling on us to take a leadership role. Okay. And Francis Morris at Tate Modern has been particularly brilliant in championing this. Yeah. And she would say, we have no choice because we, we need to change our museum practice in order that it can become sustainable in the long term. And she needed, you, you can't work with Olafur Eliasson twice over to make extraordinary shows and not address those questions in your own work and thinking. Right, right. Um, yeah. It's just, it would be a kind of form of cognitive dissonance um, to, to not address the issues that the artists <laughs> themselves are exploring. Yeah. Um, and so we do it with and on behalf of artists, but also with and on behalf of other museums. Yeah. When I was in Manchester at the Whitworth and Manchester Art Gallery, partly because we did a capital transformation there, we were able to take a lead in modeling new environmental conditions for exhibition spaces. Yeah. And, um, and Tate has done the same with the Blavatnik building. And so-, so One of the things just for, for our audience is that when a great work of art travels, we make sure we take care of it. And part of that is to make sure that the climate within the building is in a very narrow band in terms of humidity and temperature. Turns out that's very, very expensive to do. You use a lot of carbon to keep you know, a room perfectly at the right temperature as people come in and out, et cetera. So the carbon footprint can get pretty big pretty quickly. Huge. Yeah, and, um, but actually our evidence base if we, uh, if we draw on the research that the amazing conservation teams at Tate do, our evidence base is what damages works is um, sudden change yes. in temperature and humidity. Actually, they can cope with a broader, more relaxed set of parameters if the rate of change is slowed down. So we, thinking about that as a, as a principle, is much, that's much easier to achieve and yeah. it's much more sustainable long term. But we we yeah. often, uh, when I was at Shelburne Museum, we looked at, we had a folk art collection, and a lot mm -hmm. of it was in unheated buildings in Vermont, in mm -hmm. air-conditioned buildings in Vermont, and we couldn't mm -hmm. show very much damage at all, and partly yeah. because the objects became proofed to the local environment um, yeah. it, over time. That was kind of a, yeah, so... Yeah. Um, but I think my, um, uh, my Nan Francis's position is, if we do not take... Um, drastic action to reduce our carbon footprint we won't have the cities and the world to keep the collection for yeah. so we have to ask ourselves those fundamental questions about what are we what are we protecting these works for and of course as I say we look after them really really carefully but we've got to think on hundred year cycles yeah. and work differently I saw somebody in Venice cleaning a, an altar in space, you know, a conservator cleaning an altar and super great mm. work. On the other hand, you're thinking the whole thing is sinking, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's bigger issues than, right? So it was this kind of, we have a bunch of questions here. Um, a couple of people are asking about the painting behind you. Oh, <laughs> which is um, uh, called um, Water Dreaming. Um, and um, it's a uh, you know, is it a work I bought when I travelled to um, Sydney, maybe fifteen years ago? Yeah, it's Sydney's amazing city, and um, it's a beautiful work. I, I, Thank you. Yes, Thank um, you. Okay, Walt, water dreaming is it called? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, Somebody is asking uh, the most interesting new way of working that has emerged from COVID lockdown. Mm. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of this in that, um, you know, there would be very few hands up if you said who had participated in a conversation or a seminar or a studio visit or a international conference on something called Zoom. And, you know, I had heard of it. I've used it a couple of times, but nobody had used it like this. 
So um, we have just last week hosted a, a studio visit with Michael Armitage, led by um, Osei Bonsu, who is our um, curator for African art. It was just super. And it meant that, the, that many of our um, international uh, supporters who are part of our acquisition committees on different continents were all able to join together when most of them are not able to travel anywhere at the moment. Yeah. And so, although too many meetings through this kind of format can, you know, I think do, do quite bad things to your brain by the end of the day. I tried to limit it to 15 a day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the, the capacity to um, to be in other people's spaces and to hear different voices and um, and think and talk together via Zoom has been massively useful to us. Yeah. And we would never have accepted we'd we'd have tried it around the edges, um, were it not for the pandemic. But it's forced us to do it, explore all of the possibilities, do it well. And I think there's a lot that we need to hold on to in terms of again in terms of our carbon footprint and um, our international travel we need to be traveling more digitally and less on planes yes as much as i love to travel i i joke about my carbon stomp not my carbon footprint because it's it's pretty big um sometimes it's nice um to share and this is a kind of basically a question a work of art that you've seen recently that you love sometimes it's great to share something that we wouldn't know about that you just love and you want to do a shout out to a particular artist who you think is just amazing or artist. You know, you know, who's somebody like we should pay attention to? Oh, um, I think, well, we, we're just in the process of acquiring a work by um, Imran Peretta. Um, and I feel very um, passionately about this because um, it's being, it was commissioned by Chisenhale Gallery and um, the Whitworth Art Gallery, my former place of work. So I know the curators who commissioned it. Um, um, and I think, and Spike Island in Bristol, where Helen Legg, who is the director of Tate Liverpool, um, came from. So there's these three really great regional institutions that have pulled resources to commission a work from a brilliant British artist. Um, it's a, um, a moving image piece and, um, and I would strongly recommend people look out for his work and, um, um, and it's been shown in those spaces and Tate managed to poach Polly Staple from the Chisholm Gallery to come and be our new director of the British art collection yeah. and she hasn't, she hasn't, she isn't bringing this work through because she was involved in commissioning because it wasn't her, it was another curator um, um, but it's exactly the it's the kind of contemporary work we ought to be looking at and bringing into the collection and Tate should be supporting the ecology of regional galleries as well so I think for that reason it makes me very very excited um, and it's just it's a great work. We have uh, some questions here about um, and this is for both museums about um, access to ethnically diverse populations I know uh, I can say at the AGO, we last year started the annual pass, which is free for anybody under 25 and $35 um, uh, for a year to come in and out as much as you want. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we now have about 240,000 members and annual pass holders, but I would say that that move alone significantly shifted the, um, the demographics of our audience. Annual pass holders quite closely actually re uh, reflect the the ethnic and racial diversity of Toronto. So um, it, it's just the ease, it's on your smartphone, you can just check in, check out, everything's online. Um, but it was, uh, that's been one thing. And then of course, programming, programming, programming. Um, how, are you, how do you think about reaching the different communities? Mm. Well, like you, program really matters, um, but it, on its own, it's definitely not enough. That's what I've learned over the years. Um, and um, so for us, the um, Tate Collective has been um, one of the major um, uh, and thankfully hugely successful initiatives for us. And that's a membership scheme for under 25 year olds. And it's driven by very similar thinking um, to, to yours, Stefan, in that um, London, London is anyway um, uh, approaching 50% um, um, uh, minority ethnic populations, but um, it's under 25 um, uh, population is even more diverse. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and so what Take Collective does is um, make membership almost free. Um, um, 
importantly not quite free because um, feedback from uh, the under 25 year olds was that completely free um, is often read as not worth so much and yeah. yeah. um, so it's a canny thing you start joining is free so you sign up to take collective online and that's absolutely free um, but and then you pay only five pounds to go into a paying exhibition and that's in part because we've got so much of our collections which are free anyway and um, your membership entitles you to bring um, some friends along with you. So it's about a social visit. Yep. Now, we had hoped that we would get um, maybe 50,000 um, members, but in the, just over um, a year, we're up to 165,000. Exactly. exactly. And, and they want to go to many, many things. They want to go to what we might regard as our traditional exhibitions. Yep. Um, and they would say, well, why wouldn't we? We'd quite like to see... You know the Picasso exhibition or the Modigliani don't think we only want to see Soul of a Nation that would be stereotyping us yeah sure. and and um, and it's and we create public program around it late nights so often led by peers who are drawn from that group so um, younger artists and creatives are putting content together for their peers and it's just accelerated. And also there are audience um, for the future, aren't they? Yeah, um, it's exciting. There's also an accountability, right? Because you can look back, this new audience is different and expects different things and is, I think, pointing out often kind of maybe the shortcomings of our collecting practices, shall we say. I, I just was, um, you know, the National Gallery in Washington, DC, bought its first work by an indigenous person um, two weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. In the history of the National Gallery in America. So, I mean, it's, and we're better, but we have so much work to do on that too. And part of it is just responding to our audiences, that, that that's what our audiences expect. And that's a good thing, but it's also means we have to, we have to change and adapt to that changing audience. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, it's exciting. Um, how would you know, how do you kind of envision in 10 years the tape? How do you know if there's lots of issues of social justice, et cetera? How will we know if we get there? Mm. Well, I think um, the organization itself will look different and, um, and those who come to it will be different. I mean, that's what I, I want to leave, having helped contribute to that shift. That, that so um, um, our, our program has been able to shift fairly rapidly yep. you know it's interesting to be exploring um uh, challenging political work and um, you know the the prior exclusions of work by indigenous artists and um, the lack of attention to um, black british work by many of the uk's galleries those are things that are all fascinating to unpack and challenge and and help correct and yep. um, but if we don't do that alongside uh, making sure that our staff Base in every part of the organisation reflects the the country that we now are, yep. and um, we fail in our mission. I think, yep. and if the public that you know, my story of growing up and, and not really knowing about museums and having to find my own way is is one thing, um, but I came from a family that was encouraging me to be curious, and yep. um, and um, and you know had already given me some kind of pointers to where I want to go. But if young people aren't um, welcomed and invited in, if we don't um, connect in relevant ways to them, then the public that um, thinks that the public won't see us as relevant in the future. Yeah. And it is so important to me that actually everybody gets to argue about art and <laughs> Um, dislike it as well as like it um, yeah. and to be part of a conversation where um, what stands for culture is challenged yeah. and so it's not just about saying come in we've kind of it's all here it, it's actually we want a, a more diverse public in the building and um, so that there is um, in a sense um, more lively and disputatious argument about what even counts as culture yeah it's it's contested, and I think that's a good thing, a very good thing. A really good thing. Because change um, but, can't happen if it's not contested. No, so I would like to leave Tate having um, done some work which makes 
our museum on because we are one of the most important national museums in the UK I would like it to um, feel that it reflects the society that of of its of its own time well thank you very very much for joining us and having uh, sharing your thoughts with our audience um, I hope you have a really great evening thank you very much Maria welcome Bye -bye.